بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله To proceed, Ikhwan and Akhawat, brothers and sisters, respected elders, respected ulama, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's the final session from the four sessions that we're having on classified. We spoke about many things in the first three sessions. Today, I believe it's called Codename Unity. Strategic Alliance, rather. And I think this is very key and it's very good that we're going to be finishing on this topic because what I want to focus on is what do we have to do now as Muslims in, in order to change the narrative? What do we have to do to change the current social structures that are permeating throughout every society on the globe? What do we now have to do to try and establish the vision of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which essentially was peace, justice and mercy via the manifestation of Islam globally and individually. What do we have to do? And really, to be very frank, it's all about da'wah. This is where we need to form strategic alliances. And it's quite apt we're talking in Fanar, that is a beacon of light, if you like, for the rest of Qatar to show that da'wah is the way forward. Now, what do we mean by da'wah? Now, we know linguistically it means to call or to invite. But from a Sharia perspective, it means to call people to the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the narrative of da'wah. It's very simple, it's very clear. Hence, Allah azza wa jal says, Ud'u ila sabili rabbik. Ud'u. There's an amr, there's a command form. Call to the way of your Lord, the sabil, the path, the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to call towards this. But for me, significantly, Dawa itself is about a self-image psychology. Because as Muslims, as myself, as yourself, we all want to aspire to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that can only be achieved if we give da'wah. Why am I saying this? Because in the sunnah we see the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِأَخِيهِمْ وَيُحِبَّ لِنَفْسِهِ You won't truly believe unless you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And this brotherhood is not Islamic brotherhood here. And now what we said in his explanation, this is insaniya, this is humanity. And we have Imam, Rab, Imam Rajab al-Hanbali in his compendium, he discusses hadith at length, and he quotes other ahadith in Musnad Ahmed and other places to indicate that this is for humanity at large, for people at large. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us that you won't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. And if from our aqidah, our creed of framework that we love Allah the most, and we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the most, then we have to give these things, these, this love to other people. So we have to try to instill that same love that we have for Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in other people. And that can only happen by giving da'wah. Because how can you love Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa without being a Muslim? So it shows that giving da'wah, it defines who you are. Because if you want to be a mu'min, as we discussed, then this hadith comes into play. لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدَكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِيَخِهِمَ يُحِبَّ لِنَفْسِهِ you won't truly believe unless you love for others what you love for yourself. Even some ulama have said that this hadith is specific to religious matters only. So it's self-image psychology. This should create a cognitive dissonance amongst each other. What does that mean? It means that you have this kind of clash between your behavior and your ideas. You either change your behavior or you change your ideas. We're not going to change the sunnah, so we have to change our behavior. So we'll have this conflict saying, Oh, I want to be a mu'min, but I have to give the thing I love to others, therefore, 
I have to start giving down. SubhanAllah. So it's a self-image psychology thing. Also we know it's a thing that facilitates our Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, let the rise amongst you a band of people, a people from the Ummah that will call Yad'una, they will call to the Khayr, the good. Ibn Kathir, in his tafsir, do you know what he said? He said, This good doesn't mean any type of good, what you think good is. It's the good of Islam, comprehensive Islam. Not just a prayer, but everything. They command the good, the forbid, the wrong. Al-Qurtubi said, when Allah Azza wa Jalla uses the statement, and they will attain success and felicity, it means those people attaining Jannah. So if you want to come closer to Allah, if you want to truly believe, if you want to go to Jannah, command the good, forbid the wrong, give da'wah, call to the good, which is Islam. This should be enough for us to be motivated. But let's even talk about the rewards of the da'wah itself. I think one of the most amazing rewards that I think is fascinating is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the one who engages in da'wah and commands the good and forbid the evil. Think about this. Allah is the only being worthy of praise. But Allah praises us, the speck of dust in this vast universe, because you engaged in the da'wah. And we know this from the evidence of the story of the Sabbath. If we go to Ibn Kathir, we read the narrative as well, the, more, the explanation of the story. Now the story of the Sabbath, as you already know, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to test the people of the Sabbath, the people of the town who used to fish. And Allah azza wa jal gave a command that they can't fish on the day of the Sabbath, Friday Maghrib into Saturday Maghrib. And there were three types of responses. There was a group of people who disobeyed Allah on a technicality. They disobeyed Allah on a technicality because they put the fishnets out on the Friday morning or on the Thursday. And they picked them up after the Saturday on Maghrib. So technically they went fishing. And when they collected the nets, oh, it happened to be caught, so we'll eat it anyway or we'll sell it. So they disobeyed Allah. The second group of people, all they did was, fine, we're not going to fish. But that's all they did. They just obeyed the command. The third group of people, not only did they obey the command, but they commanded the ma'aruf and forbade the munkar. They commanded the good and forbade the wrong. And they did this by telling the first group to be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be mindful of His commands, to be mindful of Him. What was the result? We know according to Ibn Kathir, and apparently this is the strongest view. Number one, the first group were destroyed. Absolutely punished and destroyed. The second group of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not even mention them. He kept silent on them. The third group of people, Allah praised them. Allahu Akbar. Just by engaging in the da'wah. Also we know according to a verse, a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you call someone to a good, you get the reward of that good. Now think about the da'wah itself. You facilitate someone's iman. You increase his iman. Or even bring someone into the fold of Islam. Just one person. Wallahi, on the day of judgment, if you did this with ikhlas, you would see deeds on your mizan that you've never done before. I didn't pray this many prayers. I never used to wake up for tahajjud. I didn't do this dhikr. I didn't read this Quran. I didn't go to hajj like this. I didn't go to umrah. I didn't do a thousand hajj. I didn't have this many children, I didn't teach them all this Qur'an, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, but it's all belonged to you, this reward. Because you called one person, because that person got married, and then they had two children, and their two children also got married, and they had two children each. It's 11, just within one generation. Imagine a couple of generations. you be getting the reward for thousands or hundreds of prayers, fasting that you didn't even commit because you facilitated that by facilitating, by the mercy of Allah, one person coming to the deen. Wallahi, you find something more rewardable in Islam, tell me, and I'll do it. Tell me. This is it. This is it. And Allah even says, 
that those who engage in the da'wah are the best of people. Waman and who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah and does righteous deeds and says, I'm one of the Muslims? Allah is not asking you a question. It's a rhetorical question. It's balaga. It means the one who is better in speech is the one who gives da'wah, who calls to Allah, who does righteous deeds and says, I'm one of the Muslims. So this is the amazing reward. And we know another hadith, I believe it's in Bukhari, correct me if I'm wrong, that the Prophet wasallam said that by Allah to call someone to Islam is better than the best type of camel, the red camels. Now those type of camels at that time, it was the equivalent to the best type of wealth, which means 50,000 oil fields, owning a country, having your own island, Lamborghinis, Bugatti, Veyrons, whatever the case may be, it's all yours, that's what it means. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa saying that giving da'wah and facilitating someone's iman is greater than that, is the best type of wealth. I mean, after this information, we will be only a bit stupid not to get involved in da'wah, no? So the right question follows now, how do we do da'wah? What is the strategy? What is the method? What do we do? What do we say? It's very simple. There are many ways, but I like this particular way. I refuse to answer all the questions. Why do you wear hijab? Why do you have a beard? Why do you wear those funny clothes? Why do you guys believe in jihad? Why do you guys do this? Why do you guys do that? Why do you pray five times a day? Why do you starve yourself in the month of Ramadan? Why can't you touch a woman's hand? Why can't you shake hands with the boss? Why can't you deal with interest? Why can't you backbite? Why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Why do you stone the adulterer? Why do you cut the hand of the thief? Why is the Quran in Arabic? It could go on and on and on. I refuse to answer all the questions. Why? And listen very carefully. Because no matter what answer you give, our answers are dependent, contingent. They come from where? Tawheed, the Quran and the Sunnah. And we give people the answers without giving them the filter or the lenses from which we got those answers. That's why sometimes answers are never satisfying, no matter how rational you can be. It's like we wear glasses, the Muslims have lenses on, we have a world view. And all we see, for example, is green. The non-Muslims, their glasses are tinted red. And we're looking at the wall and we're saying, look man, can't you see it's green? He says, no, it's red. Don't be so stupid, it's green. And you argue, in order to understand each other truly, what do you have to do? Take the glasses off, swap glasses, so he could see things the way you see things. And the only way to do that is to bring him straight to Tawheed. Now, how do you do this? How do you take any question and you bring it to Tawheed? It's actually quite easy. It's easy when you know, as they say. So someone asked me a question. Hamza, you guys stoned the adulterer. What's the matter with you guys, you barbarians? So barbaric for? What's your name, sir? Good to see you. You know, that's a very valid question. I really empathize with the question because, you know, we could be a product of the media sometimes, a product of our environment. I converted to Islam 10 years ago. I had the same type of question. But, in order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have five minutes? I've linked any question to Tawheed. If he says, I just want a yes or no answer, I say to him, look, Islam doesn't give you yes or no answers. If I said to you, what is your name, yes or no? How many days in the week, yes or no? If I said to you, do you believe in abortion? You said yes. Does yes truly represent your views? The answer is the concept, my friend. If you really want to sincerely engage with me, then let's have a conversation. Let's understand the concept, then you'll understand the answer. And it is even the answer itself. Wallahi, you do this. From my experience, they always sit and stay. Even if they were insincere in the beginning to trick you out, they sit. Because the way you've done it and you've brought them to you've brought them to a correct answer, to a correct perspective, you brought them to the concept 
and you said this is the answer and you want to engage as a human being, they become sincere and they want to listen. We even did this with the English Defense League. And it worked. He hugged me at the end. So empathize. Have good akhlaq, adab. Empathize with the question. Don't say the question stupid. If he has a question that's valid, it's always valid. He's a product of his environment. Smile, akhlaq, adab, empathize. But then bring it straight to the concept. In order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Do you have some time? And then all you do now is you talk about the concept of Islam. And you could do this in many ways. In a Western context, you could start talking about God's existence, His oneness, revelation, and prophethood. This is something we have called Go Rap. Something easy to remember. God's existence, His oneness, revelation, and prophethood. Go Rap. So I would engage with the brother or with the human being and say, look, the first part of the concept of Islam is that we believe in the divine reality and the creator. And we have good reasons for this. And let me talk to you some of these reasons and give him an argument. For example, the argument I use is the origins of the universe. I say to them, it is without a doubt that the universe began to exist. It popped into existence. It wasn't always here. According to philosophers, mathematicians, and cosmologists and scientists, whether you call it the Big Bang or whatever the case may be, the universe began. It began. Even atheists like Professor Lawrence Krauss and others say T is equal to zero, time is equal to zero. The universe has a spatio-temporal boundary like an apex of a cone. It started, it began, it's object-like. If it's object-like, it has been created. So it began. So then we follow the principles of the Qur'an in chapter 52, verse 35 to 36. What does Allah Azza wa say? If you go to the Mufassirun, those who explain the Qur'an, we have four logical explanations for the origins of the universe. Yeah, they came from nothing. It created itself. It was created by something else created, or ultimately it was created by something uncreated. This is what Allah says in the Qur'an, in chapter 52, verse 35 to 36. Or did they come from nothing? Did they create themselves? Or did they create the heavens and the earth? The implicit, explicit and implied logical principles in these verses is Did the universe come from nothing? Did it create itself? Was it created by something else created? Or was it created by something uncreated? So I discussed with him Can you believe that if something popped into existence it just came out of nothing? Of course not! Let's even take this mathematically What's zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero? It is zero. What's zero minus zero minus zero minus zero minus zero? It is zero. No matter what you do with zero, you get zero. No matter what you do with nothing, you get nothing. It's what they call a metaphysical principle. From, you can't get being from non-being. You can't get something from nothing. Even P.J. Zwart in his publication about time says, if there is anything we can find inconceivable, is that something could arise from nothing. So the universe can't come from nothing. Second option, maybe it created itself. This again is absurdity. For something to self-create would mean it was in existence and not in existence at the same time. Can I exist and not exist at the same time? It's like saying your mother gave birth to herself. This is impossible. This is impossible. Now the only scientist who claims self-creation, there's a few, but a popular one is Stephen Hawking in his book, The Grand Design. He said in his book, self-creation is possible. But we need to have an Ibn Taymiyyan view on these things. Ibn Taymiyyah was an amazing scholar. He said, forget what they say. Go straight to the roots. What are their assumptions? Their presuppositions? We need to learn to think like this because the Quran teaches to go straight to the aqidah of the matter, the foundations of the matter. So we look at the root. You will not get excited just because, look, a scientist said that self-creation is possible. My iman is on the floor now. So there's many Muslims like this. Because we don't read the Quran in a way that would allow us to invoke positive thinking. Allah says, tadabbur, think, yatafakkarun, for those who reflect. Afala taqilun, do you not use your brain? So go to each other, some, what are Stephen Hawking's assumptions? And you don't even need to be a scientist or a physicist, just a normal human being. His assumptions are what? That gravity has to be there, he says it in his book, and something called the quantum vacuum. It's always been there. 
But there's a big problem. The problem is what is gravity? It's the law of attraction between two masses. So he's saying mass must exist before the rest of mass that we know to be the universe existed. Also, he says the quantum vacuum must be there. But there's a big problem. Because he believes that there are these fluctuations, these particles that come out from nowhere, that enabled the whole universe to come into existence. Not only does it sound irrational, but it doesn't make sense theoretically. Why? Because the quantum fluctuation model is very absurd. Because it says the quantum vacuum is eternal. If it is eternal, it means it's been there for an infinite number of time. If it's been there for an infinite number of time, it means that there should be other universes colliding. This universe must have collided by now. But since it hasn't, then it can't be eternal. So you know how they run away from this? They say, okay, the quantum vacuum is expanding. Okay, if it's expanding, let's rewind the clock. It means it began as well. If it began, then it needs a creator. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. You don't have to know anything about physics. Just use our brains. If you don't know, what does the Quran say? Ask those who? No. So self-creation is impossible. Third option. The universe was created by something else that was created. But that's an impossibility. It's like saying this universe was created by another universe that was also created. But if that universe was also created, then it was created by another universe. And if that universe was created, then it was created by another universe. And if that universe was created, it was created by another universe. Can this go on forever? Well, if it did go on forever, we would never have the universe today. This is why when people say, who created God, it's an absurdity. Because if I say, who created the creator that created God, and you go on forever, you never have creation in the first place. It's like, say I'm a marine, I want to shoot something. In order for me to shoot, I have to ask permission behind me. If that goes on forever, am I ever going to shoot? No. Similarly, this universe cannot ultimately be created by something else that was created because if that goes on forever, you will never have the universe. Just like Ibn Taymiyyah, he said, he said that you would, not, you would not have existence, you would have non-existence. This is something that Dr. Jafar Idris talks about as well, that you just have a state of non-existence. So it can't be created by something else created. So what's the best explanation? Number four, it was created by something that was uncreated. Look how simple that is. We've answered a 2,000 year old question via the Quran in five minutes. And you guys are worried about Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, all these people who utter falsehood in reality. But it doesn't mean God exists, it just means he's an uncreated creator. But continuing with this thinking, if there's an uncreated creator, then it must be eternal. Because if it was uncreated, it was always there. So therefore, it's eternal. If there's an uncreated creator for the universe, it means what? It must be powerful. Of course it must be powerful. Look at the sun. One sun, which is the star amongst billions of stars, one solar flare of the sun is equivalent to around a thousand nuclear bombs. So this uncreated creator is going to be quite powerful. Eternal, powerful. This uncreated creator must be intelligent or knowing. Why? Because it created beings and conscious beings that have an intelligence. Also, it created laws in the universe. And a lawgiver implies an intelligence. Eternal, powerful, intelligent. It must be immaterial. It's not made up of the universe or is in the universe. There is nothing like unto him, Allah Azza says. Ibn Taymiyyah in his works, he said, the creator must be distinct and disjoined from the creation. And this is so rational. If I made this table, do I become the table? Wallahi, we have Muslims who believe Allah is like the table. We have this. This pantheism, it's like Hinduism. Not only is it irrational, but it goes against Quran and Sunnah. And this is why Ibn Taymiyyah made a very good point. He said, there's no real contradiction between the aql and the naql. The condition is, you, you must have an aql first. You must have an intellect first, it has to be sound. Aql and salim, a sound aql. So it's immaterial. This uncreated creator must have a will. In Islamic thought, in Islamic philosophy, this is called irada, a will. That's not just some mechanical being. How can we prove this? It's very simple. If the creator is eternal and it brought into existence the universe that began it means it chose the universe to come into existence 
And choice indicates it has a will. And a will indicates it can have a personal relationship with conscious beings in the universe. Last point, number five. This creator, this uncreated creator must be one. Because if it's all powerful, then it must always manifest its power. If there was two or three all powerful beings, there'll be a clash or they'll cancel each other out. Another point to take into consideration why this creator must be one is because of a principle that belongs in Islamic thought and in Western thought. It's called Occam's razor, which is the most simplest explanation and most comprehensive is the best explanation, the most rational. What we mean by the most comprehensive explanation is that his greater explanatory scope means it explains more things rather than creates questions. So when we say there's one creator, it is simple and it has greater comprehensive scope, explanatory scope, it answers more questions. If you say there's two, three or four, it's not simple anymore as an answer and it's not comprehensive because it creates more questions like how do these two interact? How do these three interact? How to, can they coexist? So polytheism is irrational from this principle. So there you go. What have we just done using our aql? We've affirmed, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ السَّمَدْ لَمْ يَلِيدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُرًا أَحَدْ Say God is one. He's unique. He's eternal. He begets not. Nor was he begotten. There is nothing like unto him. And then you get the agreement. God exists. And then you move on, because you've discussed the oneness now as well. You go straight to revelation. You say, if God exists now, then surely he announced himself to mankind. He's not an absentee landlord that gave you the keys and ran away. SubhanAllah, when we even make something like an iPhone or a Blackberry in the box, what do you find? A manual. Now, you may think you could do trial and error, but to use the facility to its optimum, you need to read the manual. So if we can give a manual to things we make, what about the Creator? Also, a revelation is necessary because every species has been given guidance. Even animals have been given their instincts. If you study biology or ecospheres or, or biological cycles and rhythms, you see that when animals obey their instincts as they do, there's a nice ecosystem going on. There's a biological cycle. If human beings were to rely just on their instincts, there would be chaos. What? There's about 100 people in this room, 60, 80 to 100 people in this room. If I said to you, all the windows and doors are closed, we're going to be here for 60 years. And we have a basket of bread. We have to now find out how much bread we're going to give to each person. Is it going to be different for age category? Male and female, children, the elderly. Does it matter how much you weigh, how tall you are, how heavy you are? We have to have mechanisms to prevent people from stealing the bread. Once they steal the bread, we need a system to ensure that we could find out that they really stole the bread. We need to have mechanisms to actually ensure that if we find out they stole it, that there is a punishment system. We need a due process. We need to find out if someone's sick, what do we do? If someone dies, who, who takes the bread? The nearest to them or the nearest kin. Subhan, just a few people in a room and a loaf of bread. Look what we have to do. Create a model and a system. And you're saying to me that we don't need guidance. Capitalism is not the solution because one, one eighth of the world or one twentieth of the world is fine. But look at the rest of the world. Capitalism lives on the blood of other people and the starvation of others. You may say, well, we don't even need revelation. Fine. But there is revelation and we can prove it. And there are three criteria to assess if something is from the divine. Just three criteria. Number one, it must have a logical view on God. If the book says to me, God's an elephant with green arms and tattoos and a ring, see you later book. I don't even have to read it. You could judge it by its cover. Because it goes directly against innate knowledge and aql, basic aql concepts. Remember? Because it's saying that God is within creation, he's an elephant. We already established that he can't be. Number two, it must be consistent. If it says God is one on page number one, but then decides to say God is 300 on page 300, we have an issue. There's an inconsistency, it can't be from God. Number three, we, it must have miracles. 
And what do we mean by miracle? We don't mean breaking of a natural law. That's not a miracle. Because the way we know natural laws is by viewing patterns. And if something breaks the pattern, it doesn't make it a miracle. It just means that maybe we haven't been looking hard enough. Maybe it's part of the pattern. The Islamic philosophical, Islamic thought, Islamic aqidah perspective of miracles is an act of impossibility. What I mean by impossibility is not formal logic, but rather that you can't explain it naturally. You've exhausted the naturalistic explanations and you can't find one. You've exhausted them. So it's a sign to the divine, a sign to the supernatural. Take the example of Musa alayhi salam. He took his wooden staff, he threw it on the floor. What did it become? A snake. And he ate other, the illusion snakes. This is an act of impossibility. Because no matter what you do with a wooden staff, even if you make it look like a snake, paint it like a snake, give it snake skin, it won't be a snake. No matter what you do with the nature of the miraculous event, put some lemon on it, say some magic, whispering, whatever the, whatever the case may be, it would never turn to a snake. It's an act of impossibility. You've exhausted the natural environment, the wood, and you know it could never turn into a snake, therefore it's a miracle, it's a sign to the divine. This is what the Qur'an is. The Qur'an is a sign to the divine. And there are so many miracles in the Qur'an, but just for time's sake, let's speak about two. Let's start with an easy one, the historical miracle. Allah Azawajal in the Qur'an gives two titles for the leader of the Egyptians at two different places. At the time of Musa alayhi salam, he mentions the title of the Egyptian leader as Fir'aun, Pharaoh. At the time of Yusuf alayhi salam, it mentions as Malik, king. And we know Yusuf alayhi salam in Egypt, Egyptian history was the old middle kingdom. Musa alayhi salam was the new kingdom. And the two distinct, they don't change and swap names it's for those two periods. Interestingly, the Bible got it wrong, just mentioned Pharaoh. The Torah got it wrong, just mentioned Pharaoh. The hieroglyphs, the pictorial language of the ancient Egyptians was a dead language. No one knew it, it was a dead language at that time. The historians of the time never mentioned this. So we exhaust the natural historical environment, we exhaust the possibilities. And we say, how on earth did the Prophet ﷺ get this knowledge? Because about a thousand years after, we found the Rosetta Stone that allowed us to decode the hieroglyphs. And we find at the time of the Old Middle Kingdom, at the time of Yusuf ﷺ, it's Malik. At the time of the New Kingdom, Musa ﷺ, it is, it is Fir'aun. SubhanAllah. A miracle, a historical miracle. We exhaust the naturalistic explanations. Couldn't borrow it from the Bible, got it wrong. Not the Torah, not the historians, Hieroglyphs wasn't around. Then the best explanation was from the divine. Another miracle is the linguistic miracle. Very powerful miracle. Allah Azawajal says in Surah Baqarah verse 23, Wa in kuntum nazalna abdina If during doubt about this book, we have sent down to our servant Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, bring one chapter like it. Call on your witnesses and your supporters besides Allah if you're truthful. And we know that the Quran is a miracle linguistically. Even the best Arabs fail to challenge the Quran. Walid ibn al Mughira, what did he say? The best linguist of the time. He said, even he even said, by Allah, this is not from a human being. And we have Western scholars to even agree with this, and Eastern and Muslim scholars. There's an academic consensus. Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University, in his book, The Quran, a biography on page number eight. The reason I'm laughing, I had dinner with one of the brothers yesterday. And he says, don't listen to Brother Hamza. These references, he mixed them up, page number eight, it sounds good. We're never going to check them. <laughs> That's why I'm laughing. On page number eight, he says, Quranic verses as tangible signs are expressive of an inexhaustible truth they signify meaning, layered within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. Professor Martin Zamit from the Netherlands, he says, notwithstanding pre-Islamic poetry, the Qur'an is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. Professor Hamilton Gibbs said that let them bring one chapter like it, and they could not, and it is obvious that they could not, let them accept this as an outstanding evidential miracle. Reverend Arbos Smith in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadanism said, the Qur'an is a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom and of truth, it is one miracle claimed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a miracle indeed it is. We have Professor Kenneth Cragg 
He said in his book, The Event of the Qur'an, he said that multitudes of mankind must be persuaded Qur'anically. Qur'anically. Paul Casanova, in the early 20th century, in the College of France, said about the amazing eloquence of the Qur'an. We will go on and on and on concerning this. And to understand this argument, you don't even need to know the Arabic language. You don't need to know Alif, Ba, Ta, nothing. Zero. We could do it just by thinking. Because this argument is timeless, wallahi. It's not really based upon the fact that you should appreciate the language. It's based upon authentic, valid testimony. It's a valid source of knowledge. It's called authentic testimony. Professor Cole in his book, Testimony, said that sometimes we don't even know, we haven't even seen the blood circulating, but we believe to be circulating. Professor Keith Lehrer, an epistemologist, which means the study of belief, he said that authentic, validated testimony is valid knowledge. This is why we have the hadith science, the isnad, the mutton. Most of our knowledge, by the way, is testimony, especially at primary and secondary level. It's because my teacher said so, and the book said so. And that's valid knowledge because you validated it. This is the same with the Quranic miracle. There is a universally accepted principle. Some people disagree with it, but the majority who know agree. And this principle is what? No one has been able to challenge the Quran. Professor Arbuthnot, a famous Orientalist and British translator said, although several attempts have been made to challenge the Quran, none have yet succeeded. So we take this universally accepted statement, this testimony. We don't need to know Arabic. And we draw logical conclusions. Number one. Maybe it came from an Arab. Number two, maybe it came from a non-Arab. Number three, maybe it came from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Or number four, it came from God. We know it couldn't come from an Arab because the best Arabs at the time failed. That's why even Walid ibn al mughira he gave up. They didn't even accuse others. Rather, they didn't, they didn't accuse others at the end. They accused it of being from magic. And we can't be today's Arab because today's Arab is from a heterogeneous linguistic culture. There's too much linguistic borrowing that hasn't been naturalized into the Arabic. It's borrowed and it stayed that way. Whereas the classical linguistic borrowing, that language was naturalized. For example, ayah and jahannam are foreign words in the Quran. But the Quran is still mubin, Arabic, clear Arabic, because these, let, these words were naturalized into the Arabic language. But today we have words in the Arabic language. If you go to Iraq, in a village, they, you ask them, give me, what, how do you say chocolate in Iraqi? They'll say, Nestle. Nestle. You know the compi? Nestle, whatever you call it. Nestle, whatever, yeah. You go to Egypt, oh, what's the phone? What do you say, phone? Telephone. Television. I know I'm giving you crude examples, but it's true. More understand Arabic has been degenerated. This is why we have the classical tradition, the first three, three or four centuries, that has been preserved. So it can't come from today's Arab. Maybe it came from an, a non-Muslim, impossible. A non-Arab, a non-Arab non rather, because they have to know Arabic. So the other option is, maybe it came from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But this is an impossibility as well, because he was an Arab too. He was not known to cultivate poetic and eloquent skills. He didn't go to the Uqqas fair and debate with the poets. Also, the Prophet وسلم, didn't produce a masterpiece instantaneously because all masterpieces, they need revision to become a masterpiece. But the Quran is a well-known masterpiece, as Professor Martin Zamet said, it's the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. But it wasn't changed or added. Once it was revealed, khalas is there. This is unknown in masterpieces. Also, when it comes to human expression, if you have the blueprint, you can copy it. This is why we have replicas of artwork. You can see the style, the structure, the brush strokes, the texture. This is why we have replicas of even things like tables and vases. Because the blueprint is there. Even Shakespeare, he don't say he was unique. His form of the language was in the trochaic verse, iambic pentameter, blank verse. This was used by other scholars like Christopher Marlowe. Quran was unique structurally. So it couldn't come from Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So therefore it came from Allah. So easy, isn't it? 
universally accepted statement, Arab, non-Arab, Muhammad, God. Khalas. So you've proven Quran to them using two miracles. And then you say, this is the concept, but there's, a, there's another element. You don't even need to go about prophethood. You could sit here and say, now what does the Quran say? It answers the existential questions in life. Why am I? Whose am I? For whom am I? Where am I? The Quran answers all these questions. You're here to worship Allah and worship is liberating and worship is your true purpose. Because as the American writer once wrote, being born is like being kidnapped and sold into slavery. The only way to escape the slavery of life, whether you do things for your ego, you do things for social pressure, or your parents, or you do things for anything. The way to break that slavery is to do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why Ibn al-Qayyum, he said, true liberty comes with the fact that you do abudiyah, you are a servant to the divine. And worship means affirming his oneness, singling Allah out with regards to his worship, not to attribute partners with him. SubhanAllah, if someone gives you 20 pounds, someone gives you a thousand riyals every day, after three years, are you going to be picking up the riyals and say, thank you riyals? Or are you going to be thanking Allah? Or thanking the one that gave it to you? Shirk is equivalent of not thanking the one that gave you a thousand riyals every day, but thanking the money itself. It's absurd, isn't it? It's irrational. So you talked about Tawheed. And then, you, and then that could be the end of the concept. And then they now know they don't have to have an answer. Because you've established the truth of Islam, whatever comes from truth is true. But then you can't talk about the Prophet ﷺ as an external unique argument. Because he made a claim. He said, I am the Messenger of Allah. He is the Messenger of Allah. And there's four ways of assessing this. Number one, he was lying. Number two, he was deluded. Number three, he was both lying and deluded. Or number four, he was speaking the truth. Well, we know he couldn't be a liar because when you assess the reality of his history, of his seerah, you see that his psychological profile does not befit a liar. He was brave. He was offered riches, power, and women, and he rejected all of that just for La ilaha illallah. There was no smoke coming out of his house for six months sometimes. His companions were tortured and abused. He was stoned and tired for hours by children, all for La ilaha illallah. To claim he's a liar would be to claim no one has ever spoken the truth. He can't be deluded because there are very contexts in his life that he could have used to justify his deluded delusion. He could have said, yes, that happened because I'm really a prophet. But he never did this. And one example is the eclipse of the moon. When Ibrahim, his son, passed away, there was an eclipse of the moon and they thought, Allah did this because of your son. And he said, the eclipse happens for no one's death. If he was deluded, he would use his context in his favor. He can't be both because we established he wasn't a lie and he wasn't deluded. Two false things doesn't make it right. Therefore, he was speaking the truth. Look how easy that is. Just to prove the Prophet ﷺ from his life. The main contention is though, well maybe it's legend. I don't believe in your history, the narratives that you're using to prove this. Well, if they reject Islamic history, they reject Aristotle. They reject 1066, the Battle of Hastings, because our history is very robust. It came with the Isnad, with the chain of narration, and we have a science called Ilmur Rijal. We have biographical data of 10,000 Sahaba narrating hadith. So if we to reject this amazing, authentic, valid testimony, it's like rejecting the existence of Aristotle, because he came via Plato, Plato, Aflatun, as you guys say. So there's the concept of Islam. That's easy, right? Half an hour. Instead of answering all the questions, knowing about social science, justifying about deterrent mechanism, liberal philosophy, looking at the epistemic value of this and the epistemic value of that, and you know, saying, oh, it's hijab because it's modesty. That's all rubbish, to be honest. You wear hijab because Allah told you. Bas. Khalas. You don't give a false impression of Islam, but it's about rationalization. It's about the submission to the will of Allah. And we could rationalize the foundation. If the foundation is true, then what emanates from the foundation is true. Because whatever comes from truth is truth. Whatever comes from haq is haq. Wallahi, we do this method in England and we get average, what, 50 shahadas a month. 
we were in the Olympics, we got nearly 30 shahadas, 74 shahadas. 74 shahadas during the Olympics. The whole period. It happens because you really show them the unique foundations of Islam. You know what? This is more powerful. Because you may answer a question. Someone may become Muslim because they love the beard and they love the prayer. But when they go on the internet and they get shubahat, or they see things happen, they get shubahat. They know one ahkam that doesn't really resonate with them. They may leave the deen. Do you know 150,000 Muslims leave the religion in Europe every year, according to the London Times? In Bradford, in one city in London, 3,000 leave the religion every year. 75% of converts, according to a doctor in America, go back to their religion or they become atheist. We don't give them the true tawheed. Become a Muslim because it will give your life peace. Yes, it would. But that's not the reason. The reason is because it's true and tawheed is true and Islam is true and we could just prove the basis in a very simple way. So what you do now, you give them the glasses now to see the world the way you see the world. So when, they, when Allah says, do this, they hear and they obey. Because they've understood the perspective as Aisha radiallahu anhu has said, if we were to be given the ahkam, like hijab, modesty, all this stuff, we would never listen to Allah. But first the verses of the hereafter, the existential questions, man, life, the universe, God, Allah, accountability, foundational. And then when the ahkam comes, easy to follow. Because they know it's come from Allah. I always say to people like Christians sometimes, I said, look, if God told you in your Bible, if God told you in your Bible to wear a leather jacket on Fridays, to roller skate on Tuesdays and play pool on Wednesdays, would you do it? Of course, God said it. Because God knows me better than I know myself. Exactly. So stop talking to me about what the Bible says. Just tell me it's from God and prove it to me. Oh, you can't, can you? Let me show you how Quran is from Allah. It's simple, isn't it? Now, if someone comes to you and says, you guys kill babies, you're not going to say now, in order for you to understand the answer, you have to understand the concept of Islam. No, because you're affirming that maybe we kill babies. When it comes to these hot issues, you say, of course we don't. But in order for you to understand anything about Islam, you have to understand the concept of Islam. Always linking it to Tawheed. You, 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 you direct the discussion, you lead the discussion, you know your objective, and you interact with them in a profound way because you know where the path of conversation is going. But if you're like giving da'wah and they first talk about hijab, well, like, Westerners are not stupid. You know when they've asked you about hijab, they have a hundred questions still waiting. They will never ask you because they're polite. And remember, now these days, and I know this from experience of going traveling all around the world, a non-Muslim a Westerner will become Muslim. If he doesn't have Muslims around, he doesn't have the right literature and understanding. And if it's just like, for example, hijab or because of, you know, whatever, they pr they probably most likely to leave. Because you haven't given them the foundation. Because what they do, they're inquisitive. They go on the internet and they see rubbish on Google. They go on YouTube, they see rubbish on YouTube. They see all these other narratives and they say, okay, well, this is not for me. But if you give person the seed of Tawheed and the seed of the foundations of Islam, then they have the glasses now to see, to view these things, really have the concept. And you know what? It would be un in an injustice if you don't do that. Don't think the Shahada is Dawa. That's part of the Dawa life cycle. The end is Jannah, not the Shahada. It's just the beginning. Wallahi, it's just the beginning. So this is Project Alliance. We come together to give da'wah. We mention its obligation, we mention its reward, and we mention it's one of its methods that we believe to be true. SubhanAllah, you had a whole da'wah course in about 40 minutes. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, shadu wa la ilaha wa ta'ala 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 wa 